sharing the love, but let's bring it in. Let's grab a seat. Make sure you have a uh, program. If not, raise your hand. Somebody will get you one. You're going to want to follow along. It's good to see some strong mustaches here this morning. I like that. I'm 50 years old. I'm still, still a little sketchy, so, you know. All right. Let's roll out. Let's go. So good to see you guys. Really nice to see so many bright and beautiful people this morning. Uh, my name's Scott, one of the pastors here, in case we haven't met. I met my man, King Charles. Where are you at, King Charles? Where's King Charles at? I don't know where you went. Where King Charles? Anyways, I met him. He's like, I said, dude, I, I am the pastor around here. He's like, I never met you. I've been here three weeks. I'm like, I've been gone a couple weeks. Hey, King Charles, you know, I told you. I got credibility, bro. I wasn't just talking smack back there. He's like, you don't look like no pastor. God uses all of us, even the most broken, this morning as we get together. And I want to say before I get going, you know, the enemy, what he tried to use for evil in your lives and how he tried to take you out, and the things you struggle with and your insecurities and the wounds and the trauma of your past, you're going to overcome that. And he's, he has greater things in store for you. You might be in it right now, but whatever has happened to you, whether it's good, the bad, the ugly, God can turn it around and use it for good, for the saving of many lives. Come on. And the enemy is going to try to use your past and your sin and your brokenness against you. And I say, enemy in your face, bro, because God is going to heal this, turn it around, and, and we're going to see your name glorified in other people as we see healing and wholeness in this community. Amen? So you need to hear that this morning. So if you're hurting and you're broken within, just like we sing, come to the altar. God can bring wholeness and healing and transformation to our lives. And so as we go continue through this message series entitled Stepping into Spirituality, We've been presenting and going through a discipleship process. In other words, the 12 steps. Some of you may have recognized the 12 steps of recovery. And some of you are like, whoa, what are they doing here? Talking about the 12 steps. And I must remind you once again that the people in recovery that use the 12 steps, they're 12 biblical principles pulled right out of Scripture it's not self-help. It's not trying harder. It's about allowing God's truth to penetrate our hearts and transform our lives. So what we've been trying to do over the past few weeks and the next few weeks is bridge the gap between the churched people who maybe aren't in recovery and the recovery people who don't, you know, have a hard time with church people when we're all really going in the same direction. You guys get it this morning? So we've been going through this, and I want to thank... Pete, I'm not sure if he's here this morning for teaching a couple weeks ago on step five and confession. James 5, 16 is confess your sin one to another. Pray with each other so that what? You may be healed. Confession is part of the deal. And then Dana last week talked about repentance, turning things over to God. And I thank her for that as well. And I know she's out of town, but she's one of our elders, and we, we believe in the plurality of leadership, not just one voice. Isn't that cool? You don't have to listen to me every week, but you get different perspectives, you get different, you know, personalities, different, you know, uh, ways to communicate, different cues, like we'd say in coaching. One coach could be telling you the same thing when we work out. 15 times, hey, press out overhead, then somebody else comes along and says, well, you just need to push the bar up there. Like, oh, I never heard that before. Well, I've been telling you that 15 times, and Gwena comes and says it in just a different way, and you get it. That's why we need different people speaking into our lives that are all pointing us to Jesus, all pointing us to God. Okay? And today, what we're going to look at is step seven, which is on prayer. How many of you... Believe in the power of prayer. How many of you 
have had what would seem like an unanswered prayer. Be honest. You prayed for something, maybe it didn't turn out the way you thought it would. Everybody, everybody, yeah, you're like, God, why don't you do this, God? And God's like, maybe he's silent, maybe he answers in a different way. But we're going to look at this today because it's part of the process of transformation, of recovery. You guys know something? Recovery is a term that's biblical. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they felt the shame? What did they do? They hid and then what did they do? Because of their nakedness, what did they do? Oh, they covered, oh, they recovered themselves. They covered themselves. And then a little later, God comes along and says, hey, what's up? Why are you hiding? And then what does God do? He recovers them again. He provides a covering for them. Recovery is a biblical principle of God taking us and bringing us back to the original person that he created before the world got a hold of us. That's recovery, becoming the person you were before the trauma, before the hurt, before the things of this world, recovery. And prayer is part of that process. Would you guys agree with that? What is prayer? We're, we're talking to God, right? It may not be verbal, it may be in your thoughts, it's communication with God. That's the bottom line. Let's not complicate it this morning. Prayer is simply having a conversation or a relationship with God. And that's where we start out today. And this seventh step is this. Humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. So we've gone through this process of the first few weeks where we basically said, I'm powerless, sin, sin is overwhelming me, I can't do it. Step two, well, there is a power greater than me, which we know is Jesus Christ and our God who can restore us. And then step three is like, I think I'll let God do it. And that's kind of the process of life, isn't it? We get stuck, we get wrapped up in things, we, we come to a place of surrender, and we say, God, maybe I should trust you with this. How many of you have gone through life trusting your own bright ideas and your own intuition and your own fears and securities, and where did that lead you? Not too far, probably a lot of dead ends. But when we trust God, even though in this world we will have trouble, when we trust God through Jesus Christ, he brings the abundant life and we can overcome this world because Jesus has overcome this world. You agree with that this morning? I hear some amens. I like it. So this, here's where I want to start. Humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. After everything we've talked about, I wrestle with this. If I've read scripture, and I know many of you have, we know that Jesus said, and his word declares that God knows everything we already need. And that God is all knowing, he's sovereign. And even Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, just like Sounding just like step seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. He says this, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. We know that God actually cares about us. We know that he cares about us more than we care about ourselves. Why do we need to ask him to remove our shortcomings? Is it because... We're trying to talk him into something. When you petition God in prayer, are you like trying to talk him into getting your way? Or asking him to do things for you that you think needs to be done in the way that you think it needs to be done? Is it a way that, hey, those with the best, best prayers win God's approval? Have any of you ever, when you started out in Christianity and you're a small group or something, been asked to call, pray in front of others out loud or get up here? How do you feel? I just want to tell you, are you, I guess my thought is you're probably 
worried more about what other people are thinking about what you say than actually talking to God. Would you guys agree with that? Why are we more concerned when we're in prayer how God's gonna answer this prayer, what people think about us when we talk? Because I'm like, I wrestle with that. Man, I wanna sound mature. I gotta throw some, I, I have to throw some scripture in there so these guys know that I'm mature in the Bible. Because you know, those people who pray, pray like the pagans and those ungodly people, they just babble on and on and on. I mean, I want to sound spiritual. You know what I'm saying? When we think those thoughts and those fears and insecurities, who is the focus of that? Who? Me. And when we're true prayer is speaking to the Lord. And so when we see this, we're like, well, are we trying to talk God into things? Are we, are we trying to get God on our side? When you ask those questions and the things I've described, you're really still in control. You're trying to control God. Well, I think he should answer this prayer and I think this should happen. And, and man, if I pray it just, just right, he'll answer these prayers. And if, I'm just, if I say just the right thing, I can get him on my side. And he's like this vending machine in the sky that, you know, I can throw up a prayer, push A7, and I get my bag of Dark chocolate M&M's, because dark chocolate M&M's are amazing. Who agrees with me? Some of you are like, no, nah, I don't really. But that's not it. So in Matthew 6, 7, and 8, why does Jesus tell us to ask God for something? And then he says, your father knows what you need, so do not babble on like the ungodly do. Is that not like a contradiction? So why do we need to ask humbly before God to remove our shortcomings if he knows what we already need? And here's, what I'm, here's the answer I want you to chew on this morning. And it's a huge part of our position before God and our presence with people. This, I believe, is part of the answer. We ask not to change God, we ask to change ourselves. We're asking not to change who God is because God doesn't change. We ask to put ourselves in a position of humility and surrender and that God changes us as we walk it out with him. Would you guys agree with that? You better start thinking about it because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the place where we need to have a posture of dependence on God. When we humbly ask him, we are now saying, Lord, you are king. You are the power and we need you in our lives. We ask not to change God. We ask to change ourselves. We pray to form a living relationship. We pray to form a living relationship not just to get things done. We pray to form this relationship, this dependency on God, not to check off the marks of what we want God to get done in our lives, because in that moment, we're in control. Have you thought about these things before? Because I believe there's probably some of you here today, and there have been times in my life where I didn't really understand this, because I've heard things like, you know, pray and God's provision comes and he'll answer every prayer and the godly stand upright and everything's going to be good and you pray and this person's going to be healed and you go through this ailment and that's going to happen and all these things and wow, God, I pray that my finances would change, that, that my family would change, my family be healed and I see nothing and I'm like, then God's not real. What the pastor said, what, the what those people taught, that was a bunch of BS. I'm just going to turn my back, this is fake. And then what we're fed in media, and we're fed all kinds of weird stuff. I don't, I don't even know if, you got, if I want to get into all the stuff we see on social media and out there, but it's crazy. And you're like, what's true and what's false? And I'm like, what's true and what's false? 
We gotta wrestle with these things. But prayer is a place where we can trust God knowing that if he answers, it might be in a way that I don't understand. It changes me more than it changes him when we stay in consistent prayer. Without ceasing, we're constantly talking to God. My daughter recently asked me, Dad, you know, you, you're not like a prayer warrior. And I'm like, what? So I said, daughter, I pray, I'm praying all the time. Right now, in my mind, I'm praying right now. When I'm driving, when I'm praising songs, I'm down here praising God and praying him. Praise is a form of prayer to God. Did you know that? Praise, worship and praise. We're praying, we're praising God. It isn't just about who can recite certain things. It's a relationship with God, and I want you to just rest in that. Rest in that. That your communication with God, you are heard and you are seen but you may not see or hear the results that you're looking for. Cool? And so it really requires humility, doesn't it? To be humble, to humbly come before God and place yourself in a position that he is the one, he is the source of your power. And I put in your notes, humility basically means we must see ourselves as God sees us. He knows you. He knows the good, the bad, the ugly. He knows what you've been through. He knows what you need. And at some point, you can quit trying to manipulate him. Maybe if you were like me, you grew up in a family or something, and maybe you didn't have the care that you should receive. And if you had to act in certain ways to get attention, to get the nurturing, to get the, to, the gratification that should have come in a healthy relationship, you don't trust that. But that's not how God is. He's your father who will never leave you nor forsake you. He knows what you need, even when you don't know. Any parents here, grandparents who've raised kids, when they're young or even when they're old, they want things that's probably not best for them. They want to be in relationships. They want to shortcut things. They want, you know, that's my whole life trying to make things happen. And as parents, we've kind of been down the road a little bit and we're like, is that the best option for you? Especially you got maybe children or family members that are druggies, that are addicts and relapse, and they just need 40 bucks to fill up the tank. They need 40 bucks to pay their union dues. They need 40 bucks for an eighth. I mean, something else probably, you know what I'm saying? How discerning can we be? But just think how much challenge there is with godly or with worldly relationships with our family. How much more does God know what we need? And he'll blow your mind sometimes. He didn't answer this prayer and he shows up over here and you're like, I'm so grateful he didn't answer that prayer back there because look at how he showed up over here. I'm so glad he didn't answer that prayer. I had to learn and I had to grow and I had to heal and mature so that I could be the person he had intended for me in this season, because I wasn't ready in that season. Right? Some of you guys, you made some really good choices. You've, You've done like what Jesus said here in Matthew 23, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, do you guys know that song? Who sing it? Sing it. One more. You don't want to hear me sing. Let's let Rose and let's let the ladies. Those sound like angels. I'd be taking you right down into hell. Okay. That's why I let it go. Sometimes I let it fly. But humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You try to exalt yourself. You try to take the head seat at the table and he will humble you real quick like. And you know, oftentimes, 
he don't just cut you out. He lets you run it out. Prodigal son, he let him run it out until he gets to the end of himself. Until that kid got to the end of himself and then he came back and said, my father, I'm not even worthy to be your son. Just put me on as a servant. He's like, no, I love you. I'm gonna restore you. That's how we see him. And so prayer, bottom line, is not a way to try to control God. It's a way for us to release control. Yes? And there is a paradox of prayer. Paradox is a prayer that I found. It's not gonna be on the screen, but I want you to tell me if this sounds familiar. In the paradoxes of prayer, I found this when I was looking through this. Here's what it says. It's just a little poem. It says, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. Agree? I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all most richly blessed. That sound like your story? I read that and I'm like, man, that, that kind of covers it right there. What I thought I needed was really what I wanted. Then in the end, God gave me what I needed and helped me become who he envisioned. And we're still working into these things, correct? So the answer, here's where it's, oh man, this is gonna get good. I hope you guys can receive this this morning. The answer to every prayer is one, the same, and the best. Here's the answer. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Look what Jesus said in Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the gift, give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, in the end, we trust that we have an intercessor, the Holy Spirit, the one who empowers us. You see, where it comes down to is that God gives us power more than answers. Think about that. God gives you power to sustain more than answers and solutions. Anybody agree with that? and say, yes, I can see where that has happened in my life. Because you are dependent on his power, not just his answers. You have authority over your life. You have the ability to take responsibility. But, but like we've learned through this process, sometimes we lack the power to change. You have the ability to make decisions, but you lack the power to do that. And that's where God comes in through his word, through his spirit, through his adoption into his family. That's where the power to change. Does that make sense this morning? Some of you are like, no, I, I don't. I'm telling you this morning, I want to empower you with the truth. You can take ownership of your life and become a new person as you allow God to empower you through his spirit and through his word. It, it's part of being born again. It's part of becoming a new person in Christ. And here's something I want to throw out. Maybe you agree with this. Maybe you don't. I'll let you chew on it. I'm not here to tell you how to think. I'm just trying to present God's word and let you guys wrestle with it as I wrestle with it myself. Just to let you know we're all on the same journey together Just because one person hasn't been to seminary and the other person hasn't doesn't mean we don't know and love the same God and being empowered by the same spirit. 
No one's higher than anyone else around here. As long as we're submitted to God, I would say this. One of the major, one of the major, major mediums of power, one of the major uh, things that he uses is love. I would say love is the power that he gives us. And I would say, some of you call it fruit of the Spirit. I would just put power of the Spirit in there. And some of you have been reading Galatians 5 and saying, well, the fruit of the Spirit is this. I'm saying the power of the Spirit is joy. The power of the Spirit, the power that God has given us is peace. Do you bring peace to yourself or does God give you that peace through his power? It's not just fruit. Power produces fruit. Come on. The power we get in prayer, the power we get in dependence on him is kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. Some of you got the power of other people control. God gives us the power of self-control, okay? Come on, and it's driving you crazy. Some of the guys and gals here in treatment, Man, you, you hit rock bottom like I did many times. I've been in treatment many times and incarcerated for many, many times. And it's always at that point of surrender where I've been arrested, like Rosa's saying, what is humbly submitted? It's when you're arrested, you throw your hands up, okay, I'm done. And then you get into the treatment and you're like a couple, maybe a couple days, couple weeks, couple months in, and you're like, I'm done with this place. I'm tired of living with these guys. I'm tired to put up with the BS that they have all the rules they got coming down on me. I want to tell you something, you guys that are still in it. Find your power. Stay humble. Because there is a process involved, whether it's three months, 12 months, the harbor guys. It's a long journey, but you'll come out the other end a new person. And you might even actually end up on staff at As Is Church. Because every addict that I've ever met, that's, a, that's my pastor right there. Oh, you don't believe me? JP, please stand up. Pastor Josh. Oh, you don't believe me? Where's half the staff of As Is? Come out of treatment. There's Chad back there. Israel, where's Israel? I couldn't see him. I couldn't see Israel because he's so humble back there with his beautiful hair and all that Momoa looking mofo back there. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Lord. Did I say that out loud? The power. I, I got to keep going. I'm, salty, get on me when I go over my 45 minute allotment. Oh, I mean. So we looked at the power is in love. Makes me think of that old song, Power of Love. What's that, Huey Lewis in the News? I don't know, that was a good one. Back, back to the Future, some of these guys are like, what was that, before your time, before your time, back to the future. I would also say, you could interchange some words in 1 Corinthians 13 to talk about the power of God and our dependence on him. God's power is patience. God's power is kindness. It does not envy. It does not boast. God's power is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, God's power. It keeps no record of wrongs. God's power does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God's power always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God's power, his love, never fails. And when you start to lean into the power of God as you depend on him, you'll do things that are crazy. Crazy things, out of your mind, like, like you used to be back in the day. You'll do things like forgive those that hurt you. You'll do things like reconcile with someone who has repented and made things right even though you swore you'd never trust them again. You'll do things like start spending your money in a more healthy and wise way instead of blowing all your money. 
You'll do things like learn to love people, like Tim was talking about, that you don't like. You'll do things that'll blow people's mind, like that's not even the same person. That guy couldn't stay clean for more than two months. Look at him now, he's got 12 years. You know what I'm saying? You're like, you'll do crazy things that don't make sense, and we're like, God gets the glory because I humbly asked him to change my life. And I trusted him every day, one step at a time. Come on. That's what this is about. When you have God's love, this is for someone today, and you have his power, you can truly let go. Some of you have been hurting and broken for so long, you don't trust anyone, and everything about your life is control. Addiction is about control, pushing back unwanted thoughts and feelings. Doing unhealthy things is about control. Finding your identity in this world is about control. You're so afraid to trust again that you've been holding on, and it's driving you to do crazy things, and God is saying, you can trust me. You can let go. And trust me, I can carry you through this. I know it's scary. It's hard to go to new places you've never been. That's why a lot of people don't change permanently because they'll get going a little bit and then they take back control and start doing their same old thing. And God is saying every day, surrender. Every day, surrender. It's about letting go of control. Humbly asking God to remove your shortcomings is realizing, I don't have the answers, God. I I need to trust you in this process. Cool? And you gotta make it personal. A couple application points here for you. You need to say something like this. I've written it in your notes. You gotta make it personal, and you basically take it one fault at a time. As you start kind of chipping away at the things you got going on, attitudes, behaviors, problems, triggers, all these sorts of things. You gotta just take it one step at a time, one fault at a time. And say, I humbly ask God to remove my faults because I will go after the wrong thing. And more commonly, I'll go after a clever substitute for the real thing. When you try to change, that's not really transformation. When When you do what you think you need to do to change, it's more like switching seats in the Titanic. You, you deal with one chair, whatever you got going on, whether it's, whatever it is for you, and you're just like, okay, I'm gonna get out of this seat, but I'm not really gonna get off the boat, I'm just gonna switch seats, and the Titanic's going down. Because you think you got all the answers, what you've learned or where you're going, but God, he takes you to a brand new place. And this is where we have to trust God with the process. Jesus says, hey, if you try to pull out the weeds, you might pull out the wheat along with them. Do you know what that means? You try to deal with the problems in your life, you're probably gonna pull out some of the good things in your life that he planted there for you. Come on. Because we often associate life from a dualistic point of view, black and white. I'm, t- I'm here to tell you that life is a paradox. There's good and bad in all of us. There's good and bad in everything. There's challenges, there's strengths, there's weaknesses. And we need to understand that. So we need to trust God with the process. And the first thing we need to do is let God reveal our faults to us. Let God reveal our faults to us. And that's usually by failing and stumbling and falling and getting back up that we learn to trust God. In other words, it's experiential. Has anybody, I talked a little bit about it yesterday, has anybody ever changed when somebody just gave you the correct information? Do not overeat. It's not healthy for you. Do not undereat. Don't starve yourself. It's not healthy for you. Anybody ever listen to that? Do not use drugs, addict. That's what I've been. Just stop. 
You gotta learn to change. I, I could go on all day, but we gotta let God reveal that. It's experiential. And number two, allow God to remove these faults from God's side and in God's way. And you're like, what is God's side and God's way? I don't know all the answers to that because I'm trusting him in the process. He's gonna reveal that to each of us individually as we walk it out. But I do know that he uses other people that care about us, other people that have the same mindset of Christ, not your homies from back in the day, but you got some people who wanna help you grow. Maybe listen to what they have to say because they might have some insights and some wisdom because you got some blind spots. So it's important where, where you get your information from, God's word and God's people that might be heading in the same direction. I saw a meme, you might pick up on this one yesterday, it said something like this. When you see people who have what you want or living the life you want, go be with those people. And then do what they do and expect it to take longer for you to get to where they're at. And I'm here to tell you it as is. You heard Salty talk about it. Our goal is about spiritual mentorship. Our goal is to walk this out together as we follow Jesus as a healthy family in every area of life. You wanna be part of a crew that's changing the world, it's happening right here. We may be a little remnant group, but we're powerful because we have the power of God leading us. I believe it. And there are days it's hard and it's heavy because there's a lot of brokenness in this world, but we're gonna face it head on and say, hey, this ain't gonna work anymore. Enemy, darkness, violence, deaths, shootings, addiction, drug trafficking, broken families, broken homes, broken economy, food insecurity, rent insecurity, all this stuff that's plaguing all these people we love. Let's go. Let's go change the world. Come on. That's what God wants for us. So then we must pray and listen to the words of 1 Peter or be inspired by the words of 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. For me, I take that personally. He cares for me. I want to be humble. And I know when I get prideful, he knocks me down. But I also think it's about our family. We must be humble because he cares about us. And he cares about the community. And our mission statement as a church is sharing God's love with a broken and hurting world. We love because he first loved us and we wanna go share that with others. It's not gonna stay within these four walls. It needs to be in the community, it needs to be in our homes. And you can look on the back as the worship team comes back up. On the back of your program, I posted the serenity prayer. Anybody here ever heard of the serenity prayer? Anybody here probably quote it in your home groups, in your meetings, often? You guys, you guys have heard of this, right? As the worship team comes up, you know, you can use this serenity prayer to deal, to pray and work through some of your stuff that we're talking about. The first three sentences of the serenity prayer say, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the what? The wisdom to know the difference. So check it out just so you can take this home and do a little work in your life, maybe in your prayer time, in your devotional, or maybe you got someone you could share this with. You could take these and break them down and say, you know what? First point, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And you just have to state the condition or whatever you wanna work on, maybe one of these shortcomings, one of these faults, something like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the brokenness of my childhood. God, grant me the serenity to accept that things are really broken and I still carry a lot of trauma from my childhood. And then you take it, the courage to change the things I can. 
God, give me the courage to change the way I act out and the pain I feel from the victimization of my childhood and the wisdom to know the difference. God, would you give me the wisdom and the power to know that you're taking me to a new place and that you're healing those memories of my childhood and that you're bringing wholeness and that if I change, that'll bring change to my family. And God, I humbly, humbly walk with you through this process. So Father, this morning with everyone listening, I pray that you would give them the courage, the wisdom, the strength, the peace, the serenity to humbly lean into you and ask you to bring about the changes that would be permanent in their hearts and in their minds. And Father God, I lift up every family represented here today that is broken, which is every single one of ours. Every one of us has stuff to work on. God, would you bring healing? Would you bring wholeness? Would you bring truth? God, would you continue to use Mario to be the change in his family as he lives for you? God, thank you for the work you've done in his life. God, I thank you for the families and the fathers that are represented, that we would stand up as men of courage, of peace and patience and kindness, empower us to be present for our kids, to be present in the lives of those we love. I pray for the adults here, even at my age, 50 something year old, that still carries father wounds and brokenness that hurts, God. And when it comes up, God, I turn it over to you because you are my father that has never left me nor forsaken me. God, I know you've given me an eternal inheritance. And I pray over every family that's going through it right now, that's facing addiction, that has family members that are crazy like mine, and those that haven't even come to the Lord. We pray right now for our family members in this community that don't know the Lord, that you'd bring them home, that we'd see change, and that we could learn to trust them again. And Father God, give us the wisdom to know who to trust and who not to trust. We don't have to let everyone in, Lord. We understand that you've demonstrated that. Father God, I lift up all the youth that we, that we love and we care about. We have, we have so many beautiful youth, sons and daughters that we see today, that we love wholeheartedly, that we wanna see change, that we wanna bring wholeness to their lives and see them have a good future. Give us the strength, God, to carry out the mission you've given us, that we wouldn't hold back when it comes to trusting you, God. I thank you for everyone here in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand? And we need to continue to express. Please stand this morning as our, we call out our love to God. He calls us to the altar. He says to bring it in. Bring it to him. Bring it to him in prayer and praise and worship. Let's go. Love you guys.